Greetings to my fellow residents of the city of Evansville. Every year in the early spring, I deliver the State of the City speech, highlighting the wonderful progress Evansville is making in so many areas. This year's State of the City was originally scheduled to be delivered to the Rotary Club of Evansville on April 14th. We settled on that date last year. In fact, as is typically the case, we began to develop a rough outline of the speech early this year. So many projects are on our plate, so much progress to report. We were lamenting about how difficult it would be to include all of our positive progress in this annual speech. That period of 2020 seems like a year ago and not just a few months ago. Not only can I not deliver the speech in person, but it's now impossible to even present this evaluation of our city without focusing primarily on how we are responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Because of our response and so much more, I'm really proud to report to you that the state of our city is resilient. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, our community has pulled together as is customary during a time of need. It's a special honor to serve as your mayor during this time. I have a front row seat to witness a city full of grace, charity, kindness, compassion, and a profound sense of humanity. From providing meals to the children of the city at our select schools and CK Newsom Center, to neighbors helping neighbors, hospitals collaborating in the name of public health, raising millions of dollars for stressed nonprofits, police officers producing a music video promoting social distancing, volunteers and faith communities helping the homeless. My friends, if you can think of a good deed, it is being performed right here in Evansville. Let me start by describing the COVID-19 Crisis Response Fund of the Greater Evansville Region. The exceptional work of Amy Canterbury, Pat Creech, Bill Bussing, and Bob Jones will assist nonprofits working in the human services sector to better assist the most vulnerable among us. This response fund will benefit organizations in Posey, Vandenberg, Gibson, Warwick, and Spencer counties. We announced the creation of this fund on March 27th with $1.4 million in commitments. The next day, Bill Stone, president and CEO of SS&C Technologies, offered a $500,000 match. Within a matter of days, we met that match, allowing Southwest Indiana to take full advantage of Mr. Stone's generosity. Since then, the United Way of Southwestern Indiana, in partnership with the United Way of Posey County and the United Way of Gibson County, has been awarded a $1.95 million COVID-19 Economic Relief Initiative grant. That grant was made possible through a partnership between the Lilly Endowment and the Indiana United Ways, the state professional association of which the three United Ways are members. The United Way of Southwestern Indiana is the fiscal sponsor of our fund. Our ultimate goal is to raise $6 million. At this time, we've raised more than $4.7 million. I'm equally proud of the good work led by Ross Chapman with 4 Evansville and our friends at Community One. They've created the Need a Neighbor initiative, which matches a person with a need to a person who wants to meet a need. Maybe it's a neighbor who needs a grocery run or a pharmacy run, perhaps a prayer. Maybe the need is someone just to have someone to talk to. Whatever the needs, our city is responding. As of this time, approximately 400 needs have been met. You can list the need or volunteer at www.needaneighbor.org. Hundreds of families have been nourished in recent weeks by the Feed Evansville effort championed by City Council President Alex Burton and Lisa Vaughn. They've led a group of community volunteers in providing grab-and-go meals at the CK Newsom Center. Other nutritional needs are also being met by the Junior League of Evansville as they have joined cafeteria workers of the Evansville Vandenberg School Corporation and others to feed families at a number of our Evansville schools. I'm thinking of the fine collaboration between Deaconess, Ascension St. Vincent, and the Vandenberg County Health Department. A special thank you to Sean McCoy, Dr. James Porter, Dr. Gina Hunke, and Dr. David Ryan of Deaconess, Dan Parad, Dr. Heidi Dunaway, and Dr. Roger Johnson from Ascension St. Vincent, 
and Dr. Ken Spear, Joe Grease, and Lynn Herr from the Health Department. These men and women epitomize professionalism. Their medical leadership and that of thousands of healthcare workers they represent is nothing short of amazing. These represent the larger efforts around the city during this public health crisis, but this is by no means all that is being done. Now more than ever, we, we need each other, and that's why in every part of our city, citizens and institutions are pulling together for the greater good. It's the Evansville way. Like many cities, Evansville is operating on parallel paths. The continuation of social distancing, avoiding large crowds, practicing strong hygiene, but also with an eye toward reopening the city for business. That's why I've asked Deputy Mayor Steve Schaefer to lead a reopen task force. There are five major areas of focus for the task force. First, business assistance. Tara Barney from the Southwest Indiana Chamber of Commerce is leading this effort. We want to make sure what businesses need and offer them guidance on how they can reopen in the safest, healthiest manner possible. Virtual meetings by industry sector are well attended and the discussions fruitful. Dr. Steve Becker from the Stone Family Center for Health Sciences is leading our next area of focus, workplace safety and testing. Specifically, Dr. Becker, with assistance from the local healthcare community, will determine the prevalence of the COVID-19 virus in the community through testing to provide employees and businesses with a greater sense of comfort to reopen. A local medical advisory group is also developing additional guidance and best practices in preparation for employees returning to work. A healthy quality of life is vitally important to Evansville and that's why it's a third point of focus of the task force. The city has made wonderful strides in sports tourism in recent years, so the quality of life team will focus on regaining that momentum and develop reopening plans for our parks and Mesker Park Zoo. At some point in the relatively near future, we'll be able to reopen the Civic Center to the public, so we have a team working on government operations. And the fifth area of focus is food security. As I mentioned, Lisa Vaughn and City Council President Alex Burton are leading this charge. A great deal of work has been done in recent weeks to ensure families don't go hungry. That work will need to continue into the foreseeable future. I anticipate a measured reopening. That is to say, we won't go back to pre-pandemic business models for a while. We are in regular communication with the state administration which ultimately will provide direction on how and when we reopen. Certainly, a lot more to come in these areas. Please know that I appreciate everyone's patience, understanding, and flexibility during this unprecedented time. We'll get through this together. I would like to touch briefly on some of our positive progress not related to COVID-19. Reduced traffic because the stay-at-home order has allowed crews working on city paving projects to work not only in a safer environment, but also more efficiently. I'm pleased to report that Stringtown Road between Diamond and Pigeon Creek has been repaved, as well as Columbia from Fulton to Lafayette, Lincoln between Bakey and Van, Fielding Court between Lincoln and the Lloyd Expressway, Hoosier from Morgan Avenue to Old Boonville Highway, and Hirsch from Green River Road to Burkhart. There are three other projects also underway, Broadway Avenue from Barker to the City County Line, Alvard from Washington Avenue to Lloyd, and Bellmead from Southeast 8th to Alvard. Now another important infrastructure and public safety project is now officially in NDOT's queue. That's a new pedestrian crossing at US 41 and Washington Avenue. This is a dangerous intersection, especially for bossy high school students walking to and from school. A project of this kind doesn't happen overnight, but NDOT has begun the analysis and design process. And the city and state have officially executed a memorandum of understanding to solidify the cost sharing agreement. This is slated as a 2023 project, but the state knows we'd like to see it happen sooner if money becomes available sooner. A special thank you to Bossy Principal Aaron Huff, the student leaders at Bossy, and interested citizens who have advocated for this solution for many years. 
Underground infrastructure draws a lot of our attention as well. I'm pleased to report that the affluent pump station project on Veterans Memorial Parkway is going well. This is part of the federal mandate imposed on the Evansville Water and Sewer Utility to upgrade our sewer system. This facility will have the capacity to treat 40 million gallons of wastewater per day. You may recall from previous presentations that the treated water will be returned to the Ohio River by means of a cascade. A decorative overlook will provide a picturesque view of the waterfall into the river. I'm pleased to report that the relocation of Waterworks Road as a result of this project has gone smoothly also. This traffic reconfiguration will provide for a much larger area of connected green space, allowing for a combination of recreational and utility usage. We also continue to improve customer service for water and sewer customers. We have a new and improved customer portal and smartphone app. In fact, the revamped phone app, My Water EWSU, makes it easier than ever to track your water usage. We've also added a utility bill pay kiosk in front of the Civic Center. This gives customers yet another means by which to make water and sewer payments. Now, work has understandably slowed on some of our downtown projects, but progress is continuing nonetheless. The Post House project is looking really good. This 144-unit smart living facility is scheduled to open around the 1st of June, although that could float a bit given the current environment. The new Deaconess Clinic and Research Building, the second structure on the medical school campus, is also nearing completion. This 95,000 square foot facility is expected to open sometime around August 1st. And progress continues on an important quality of life project. There's covered construction fencing around the site of the future Deaconess Aquatic Center, but there's a lot of work underway behind it. So far, excavation work is complete for the competition pool. Workers have completed installation of piles for stability of the pool. Stormwater piping is installed. Underground piping for the pump room is complete. The underground electrical is installed. Workers continue to build the foundation for the two pools. We are looking for an opening in the summer of 2021. Opening around the same time in 2021 will be the Wayne and Beth Kinney family Penguins of Patagonia exhibit at Mesker Park Zoo and Botanic Garden. This project has been slower to start as a result of the pandemic, but thankfully we've raised enough money in the private sector along with a generous grant from the state of Indiana that will allow us to start this project. There's still a line item in this year's capital budget for the project that we will have to cut. But thanks to the outstanding work of Capital Campaign Chair Margaret Cook, Zoo Director Eric Beck, Development Director Jennifer Evans, we were able to start this project without a major financial infusion from the city this year. In the relatively near future, we should be able to announce the revised relocation schedule of the LST 325. The new visitor center on Riverside Drive is looking really sharp and I know the LST board is anxious to move the ship to its new home as soon as possible. That's simply a snapshot, but evidence that work is happening and big things are on the horizon. Without a doubt, the current health emergency has made our jobs more challenging, but the challenge is tempered because of the phenomenal work of our first responders, healthcare workers, and other essential workers who are all sacrificing so much to help and to protect us. If you work in the healthcare profession, answer a 911 call or make an emergency run, stock grocery store shelves, or come to work so that an essential workplace stays open, please accept my heartfelt appreciation. You are the heroes of our story. We're in this together, and yes, there is light at the end of the tunnel. May God bless you, and may God bless the city of Evansville.